know, this is one of the great things about life. You know, you 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 work in a place, you see people, and you you know them. You see them, they come in, they do the same. They they especially in a shop like this, they like they buy something, you know, for what they buy. But do you really know them? And then finally, get to, you finally just wake up one day. Go, hey, what is it you do? And you're shocked to learn that they do something really really cool. And maybe they don't think it's cool, but really it's cool. And you know, today I'm joined by David Leather, and he is the food smith. And I'm really excited to talk about this today because I really think, David, man, you've got one of the coolest. You've taken a concept and just not only employed some really cool business strategies, but man, you've really just ramped up the creativity with what you know how to do, which is awesome. And when you ask about it, it's like, these are my reasons why. And I think that's like, that's a good checklist to, to, to have. Um, at the end of the day, man, it's just a it's just a cool concept. It's a really cool concept, and I'm really really excited to kind of unpack this with you a little bit more. I mean, we know we've talked about it a lot. We've seen we're going to see some pictures today, which is really cool. And you got a lot of traction, and you've only been doing this how long now? Uh, say 24 months, so two years. So about two years. Mm-hmm. Okay, well that's pretty good, man. <laughs> that was your COVID project. It was. Yeah, three months into COVID after being laid off. So two, wow. All right. Well, let's 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 back up a little bit. You're a chef. No, but cl- classically trained. I've been in culinary trained. school over 25 years. So. 25 years you've been a classically trained culinary chef. Well, I've been out of culinary school for 25 years, but okay. I grew up in the restaurant industry. You know, my dad had actually, he never had a restaurant. He had food trucks and food trailers. So it's kind of ironic that I'm now doing a f- food trailer. Really? And uh, What kind of food trucks? Um, Barbecue. Yeah. Oh, man. Do so you we, make barbecue? So, uh, Is that your thing? I, my More my brother. Ah, I can okay. smoke meats, but my brother really does. Okay. He kind of took more like after a good my bar- I like good barbecue. I do, too. Yeah. We actually had uh, two days ago, I guess, for Christmas, we had brisket. Nice. So, no, I didn't want ham. I didn't want – I wanted brisket. Okay. So we had a beautiful right. beef brisket. <laughs> but, I mean, and we, we, were doing, we were doing food trucks in the 80s before food trucks were cool. Yeah. You know? So and then that's just kind of got my love for, for food. I graduated high school, and then I went, I went from – little town in Mississippi all the way to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to go to culinary school. So why'd you pick that school? I wanted to get away. Uh-huh. And my mom was get out of the South. Yeah. I want to get, I wanted to get away as far as I could from my little, my little town. And, um, and then my mom was kind of like, uh, you know, she was okay with me going there because I had a family that lived in Pittsburgh. So, oh, okay. So that was kind of That's her, nice. her, her soft, you know, being, I do think everybody should go away to college or to school. I do too. It's just nice. It's just, there's something about getting away, getting out of the nest, you know, and kind of just new experiences, especially well, I, if you go to another state. Well, I, I, just, I, I grew up on the whole idea that I was, I didn't, I'd like, I felt like I didn't fit in, that I didn't, wasn't meant to live there. And mm. so I couldn't get away. I couldn't throw my hat high enough when I graduated. I was like, I'm ready to get out of this town. But then it was like, now I'm kind of, proud of where I'm from you know it's kind <laughs> of like, how that works out it, it does and everything I think it was the whole thing was is I saw I saw a population in my town that never left that yeah, they it's they pretty common they, small towns. they lived there you know and they died there you know and I just didn't want to be that norm because I've never wanted to be the norm right and so um once I figured out that I could come back and visit and then I could leave I could come back and visit and I could leave that I was not going to stay there it made me proud of where I was from so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so, so how long are you in culinary school? Uh, it's about a year and a half. And so, you, I, so I have a, what's called a associate's degree in specialized technology, mm-hmm. which I tell people it's a uh, associate's degree in culinary arts. But the reason why they say specialized technology is because then they can take the, they can take the curriculum and kind of craft it to chefs. So instead of taking like regular math, we take math that has to deal with like menu costing and this and that and everything. So they kind of craft it. It's like we did a um, psychology class because they felt like we needed to learn people and understand people to be able to manage people. Okay, so, so there's a question. As, uh, can anybody do this? Can they just go to school and like, I like to say, I say I like to cook, right? I, I'm, I, I don't, I enjoy cooking, but I don't really know what I'm doing. I mean, does, cause I had a mentor and she, she said she went to culinary school mm-hmm. and she could cook some pretty good meals, but she wasn't a chef. She wasn't even like even near that business, you know, or anything like it. But I think she just did it for the heck, just to learn to cook better. Um, or is it like going to art school? It's like you can go to art school, you can learn some tricks, but you either got it or you don't. You just said it right there. You either got it or you don't. I mean, when I started, my class was probably 20. Yeah. By the end of it, we were down to 10. Mm-hmm. So we had lost half 
within a year we lost half of our. So they weed them students. out pretty quick. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. And then and then I actually, I kind of keep in touch with a lot of my. We're not a lot. Probably about three or four of the students that were in my class, and they're not even in the food service industry. Oh, they got out quick. Oh yeah. I, I would say probably of the ten that I graduated with that class. There's, I'm probably the only one that's still. I have to say, career. man, I can. There are very few careers I can think of that are just are, are such a grind. That business is brutal. Long, it's, it's long, brutal, hours. long, long hours. I mean, the most I've ever worked, like straight without a, without like taking a break, um, for say to sleep. I guess you would say. I mean, I took a break dur- throughout the day, but it was 48 hours. Wow. We just went one banquet into another banquet into another banquet. Um, the most I've ever worked in one week was 120 hours in one week. And there's 168 hours in a week. So I had to do that. Man. I, I, one time I was at... This, this early on in your career? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I could do it now in my 40s. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, there was one part of my career where I, I was working so much and I lived about 40 minutes away from the resort that I started figuring that, okay, well, if I just get a cot and I push this cot into my office and then every day I pull it out and just sleep there and then I work something out with uh, with housekeeping to, to wash my clothes for me and some of that because I did my uniforms but I needed other things washed too, um, then instead of going home, I could actually, 40 minutes there, 40 minutes back, I could sleep another hour and 20 minutes. I mean, that's how slept meant to me at that time because I was working so much. It's like hour and 20 minutes of sleep means something. And so mm-hmm. I just pull that cot in and out each day. Why'd you Why'd you go down that road? I mean, out of culinary school, you just were you just I was going to be a, this kind of a. It's it's kind of <laughs> almost that mentality. Yeah. It's like it's like you got to put in your time because you know that the chefs that are above you have put in that time too. So it's kind of, you know, back in the day it's changing a little bit the industry, but it, back in the day it was very militia. You know, it was it was like, like you know when the chef walked into the kitchen, you kind of I don't really say stood at attention, but you kind of like knew that the chef was coming into the kitchen and it was kind of like, I mean, uh, the whole chef with the whole chef show bear and the whole, yes, chef, yes, chef. That's how it was uh-huh. and everything. And it, it's still like that, still like that, but not as vicious, as harsh as it, as it used to be. So what did you start off on when, when you got out of school? Cause I'm not, you didn't just run in and become a chef and they just put you at like the, you I'm, just I'm tearing some, lettuce or I'm yeah, washing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, culinary, culinary, or, school, culinary school, they break it up. Mm-hmm. So each, you have like, a, you know, a class. So the class, basic basic class you might start off with is knife skills and egg cookery and vegetable cookery. And then you go into soup stock and starches, meaning that they'll teach you how to make perfectly cooked like rice and then to make stocks and make soups and this and that. And then you might go into next class will be meats and they'll teach you how to fabricate meats. And then the next class might be seafoods and then the next class might be pastries. So they kind of break it up. When you get out in the industry, it's kind of the same way too. It's like if you get on the line, then you have your stations that you work on the line, but you don't want to become stagnant. You don't. You want to constantly be changing and doing new things because it's all about learning. I mean, in the, the day, that's all it's about. It's like one of those. I don't know. I'm sure there are a bazillion more jobs like this, but it's one of those jobs where it's like you really have to spend your time as an apprentice. Yes. Learning the learning the details. Well, and, the, and there's like it, it's as much art science as, as it is art you know it's like because I think about like chefs are saying this will bring out this flavor and this little ingredient and I'm like I don't even know what you're talking about like they didn't learn that at the culinary school they learned that through experience right so I mean I say that all the time it's like especially if somebody here in this state actually approaches me because we have that program to where a student come out go out of high school and they can go into a community college we have a phenomenal community college here in town that has a phenomenal culinary program it's like Take advantage of that. That's Columbia State, right? Or no, no, actually, National State. National State. Okay. Yeah, over off of twenty four. Okay. It's like it's like take advantage of that. Go get your degree, okay? But then get out into industry and work. And at the same time, work while you're also getting your degree. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you. <clears throat> so, I broke my arm while I was at, while I was in culinary school. Oh no! Right handed, broke my right arm. Skateboarding okay? accident. <laughs> actually, on a bicycle. <laughs> yeah. So, um, rad. And so, yeah, it really was. And so, uh, but I had the dean wanted to send me home because at the time I had a 4.0 and I had not missed a day. He said, we want to send you home because we don't want you to, you know, to, to your grades to sacrifice due to now you have pretty well handicap, you know? And so I said, no, because that's how hard-headed, how, how hard-headed I am. 
And and so I, what I did was I filed my cast down to where I could still hold my knife, and then I took all my, like I would take a tape recorder and put it up on the you know podium with a professor and and take all my notes that way, and I studied that way, and I still held a 4.0, I didn't miss a day, and I had perfect you know well perfect attendance, and then I had a presence list, and then it's so at the end of it I had become valedictorian in my class, but I was a horrible high school student because I didn't want to be there. You know? Where'd your work ethic come from? Would you where would you say? I mean, my, my brother and I joke that my father believed in child labor. <laughs> <laughs> it was instilled in you from an early age. I mean, it, it was it was kind of like not a point where we did it because we had to have like money to be able to buy something. Mm-hmm. We did it because we knew that for my because my my dad was an entre- I mean he he was self employed. I mean he he started his you know his barbecue restaurant back in in, in mid eighties. And then, and then, so we worked because we knew that we had to, to help, mm. you know, this is what brings in, you know, an income for our family. So we have to help, we have to help, you know, and, 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 and there's, I, I, I mean, I, I did, I've done other things. Like I was avid runner and I mean, I started running probably when I was 13 and I still run today. And it was just like, I was just committed. I mean, no matter what. And that's how I've always been. So I think that's just a, an instilled DNA thing in me is that if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it 150% no matter what it is. So so your career, I, mean, I definitely want to get into the trailer. Um, your career, you know, you, obviously you were like everybody else that's kind of been in the chef business. You, you worked your way from, the, you know, the, the bottom. Tr- yeah, trenches. The trenches up to, and you were, um, how many restaurants have you worked in? Can you, you said you're doing this 25 years? Over my career time? Yeah. Probably, probably 10, 15 restaurants, but <laughs> I've done other things too. Like I've been a personal chef. I've been a mm-hmm. chef at a, I have a, a um, seasonal resort. So in other words, I went up there and we came in in June and September, mid-September, we're done. So it was literally up in almost back in the island, a Michigan area. Yeah. And then, uh, then I would go down to Florida it's and a nice place. work. And so, and so uh, I've, been, I've been, let's see, I've been executive chef of a hospital. I've, worked, I've been a chef at a casino. I mean, on and on and on. So I've done a lot of different things in my career. And so I always say that being a chef is like a highway. It's like, it's like you're, you're riding down the chef's highway and then all of a sudden you take an exit and then you just come right back off and you go do something else. So each time that exit is something different, you know, being a chef at this or being a chef at this or being a chef at this or this and that. So Why, where did that mentality come from? I, it, it comes from that, that I, did wanted. you know, cause like, here's the thing I've, you know, I've done a lot of careers. I can honestly say I very rarely had a compass or a map, you know, it was just like I was wherever the wind blew, I went, um, and don't get me wrong, I've had a lot of experiences and I've, you know, learned a lot. But at the same time, it's like, man, if I just had a little bit more of a dir- of a guiding star, you know, mm-hmm. which I don't think I ever had. I don't think I had that beacon in the distance that was like, this is where I'm headed. Um, you know, because I wasn't one of those people that was like, hey, I'm going to be a chef. I'm going to be a dentist, you know, or, you know, I'm going to be a lawyer. You know, for me, it was like, I remember when I filled out the application for the ACT, I was like, I don't know what I want to do. You know, I didn't know. I had no idea. I wanted to be Luke Skywalker. Like that was a thing, <laughs> you know, I it. when I, I was it. a kid, you know, but like, um, you just have one of those minds, you know, I think, well, I mean, it, so the question is, is like you saw opportunities working at a hospital, working at a resort. Obviously it's cool to go to Vegas and work in a casino, you know, but it's like, Here's one of the coolest things <clears throat> at the hospital was when I when I did my tour to to make the decision, the thing that sold me was you know, I was I was really going to be there to uh, cook dinner or cook cook for the executives. That was really the reason why. And then I would look over other things too, like the food court, this and that, and everything. Um, so I saw two. I saw one thing that really really interested me that I wanted to learn how it worked. And it was when they were doing the patient's food. Now, there was nothing I could do to change the patient's food. Patient's food was all done by dietitians. So it was they were going to eat what they were going to eat. It was a system of how they, once they plated the, the patient's food, of how it was prepared. And they had this system there that was like a multi-million dollar system that they would plate the food. They put them on this tray. This little thing would fall over in this like little disc in this dome. And then it would push it into a, you know, a, a cooled, you know, like a 38 degree refrigeration. 
And what happens is it was all about a computer system. So at five o'clock, it would it would need, like, say, 30 minutes to get ready. Well, they would need to deliver by six o'clock. So at five o'clock, this little thing would fall over, click in it on there. It, it would therm the food while it was sitting in a 38 degree refrigeration. And so I was just like blown away with that because I was like early 2000s. And I was like, I want to come to learn how to do how this all works, which I probably never would implement that ever in my career unless I kept being a yeah, chef of a hospital. You're a farm to, farm to table guy. <laughs> yeah, but that interested me so much. I was like, I know nothing about that. I want to learn so about that. You would, would you say your career has been driven by your desire to learn more? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I, so, so um, I had a chef. So we, you have the American Culinary Federation, mm -hmm. and there's a chef. He's, he's a master chef, so he's a CMC. There's only like probably less than 70 of them in the country because it's such a high thing to to to, to gain you know it's like a seven-day test and it's and then is the, the knowledge base is is you know, just crazy that you have to know to be able like i've heard things about chefs taking that and just like blown away with like oh they had to you know create something with gelatin but that they didn't have gelatin what they did was they had bone marrow and they had to derive gelatin from the bone marrow to be able to create that dish you know, that kind of situation, the knowledge base. So um, I was working one time at this charitable function with this with a, with a certified master chef, and he, he looked at me and he said, he goes, every day I learn something. And I just kind of look at him and go, like, I mean, this is like Yoda telling me this. And I'm just like, you know, like blown away. He goes, that's why I'm a chef. Because he asked me, he goes, why are you a chef? You know, I kind of came with this vague answer and everything. But then when he said that to me, he's like, I'm a chef because every day I learn something. And like when I go in and I talk to culinary schools, like if I went over to National State, one of my examples I do is I usually hold an, up an apple and I ask, I ask them, I say, what is this? You know, they think it's a trick question. I'm just like, it's not a trick question. What is this? And they're going, apple. Okay. Well, how many different types of apples are? They never get anywhere close to how many different types of apples there are. And I usually tell, you know, a kid that's 18, I was like, you know, tomorrow you stopped doing what you're doing and your your main goal in life was to learn everything about apples you took this let's just say uh, let's just say a pink lady pink lady is one of my favorite apples ate that pink lady learned everything about that pink lady documented it and then moved on to the next one they might not in their lifetime learn you know scratch the surface of learning everything about apples and that's the whole thing it's like the food industry is so broad that every day i know i'm gonna learn something how many different types of apples are there? It's like 7,500 different varieties. 7,500? Yeah, different varieties. Yeah. So. I mean, all, but then, it, and how much is that is on purpose? Or is it just, that's just how nature did it? That's just how nature did it. Wow. Yeah. And, well, and, and I was going to think like, yeah. I was thinking like 30. No, and we're, and we're losing a lot of them. We're oh, losing really? a lot of them. Yeah, there's there's a lot of um, guys, I don't know what you exactly call them, but they, 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 they're seed collectors. You know, they're trying yeah. to preserve these these seeds because we're losing them. So. It's called Monsanto. Because I think, it, yeah, because I think, <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> I, I think at one time we were up close to 10,000 different varieties, but they're only like 7,500 they know now. So, but, I mean, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, they'll always ask me too, like when I'm at a culinary school, they're like, yeah, do you have any advice for these students? I'm like, yeah, check your ego. Really? Yeah, check your ego at the door. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing. It's like, you know, you have these young kids that are coming out of culinary school, and it's like they, first off, want to be the next Food Network star, which is not going to happen. It's not. No. It's not. I mean, they have, a better, they have a better chance of becoming a professional football player because with that odds, you got so many teams, so many players, it's an ad. Well, if we can turn on the Food Network right now, there might only be, let's just say, 10 different chefs that have shows at the time. So, other words, you're going to be one of those 10? You know, we don't, I mean, I, I always say this. We don't watch Paula Dean because she can cook. We watch her because she's a tragedy. <laughs> and it's like a wreck. You know, you're riding past yeah. a wreck and you, you're you looking to, you're looking at it. You know, you're flipping through the channels and you go, did she just put a pound of butter in that? Whoa. And you flip back and all of a sudden, 15 minutes later, you're watching her. We watch her because she's entertaining. Because she says y'all with 10 syllables. You know, that's why we watch her. So if you don't have a personality, you're never going to be a Food Network star. But then they, what they want to do is they want to come out of culinary school also being the executive chef, which is not going to happen. You have to, as we just talked about, you have to put your time in. You know, it's like, I, I finally asked a culinary instructor, I was like, what, what do you, why? Why do, why do you see this? And he goes, entitlement is what it is. 
That's in every industry, by the way. He goes, they don't want to work hard for it. They're entitled. And I said, well, if, if, if you could see one thing, he goes, it was when we started giving away that participation trophy. That's when it was. They didn't have to work to get first, second, or third. You know, I had, a, I, had a, I had a, this was a, a guy I used to work with, and he was a millennial. Yeah. And he would say, this isn't my fault that I got the participation. I didn't want that trophy. My yeah. parents wanted it. So he he straight up said this, the reason I got entitled was because my parents made sure I did, you know. Um, it was an interesting perspective. You, know, you think about it, it's like who right. really encourages entitlement? Um, because a lot of stuff's encouraged at a young mm-hmm. age, and, that, and truthfully, man, that's that's in every business oh, that's out. There. Everybody that's in film school thinks they're going to come out and be the next Steven Spielberg, and yeah. you know they're not. They're going to go straight to being a production assistant. Go get the coffee. Go roll this cable up. You know, stand over here. What's what we just talked about? It's like you know they come out of culinary school and they want to be they want or you know if they want to be this this and this or they want to open up a restaurant and it's like just maybe you are a good chef. Maybe you are this like child prodigy and stuff. Like that. But the thing about it is, even being a great chef doesn't mean that you can open a restaurant up. I mean, that, open it up or being a restaurateur is being a businessman. Mm. That's what it is. Or a business person. So. And very few people probably have both skills. Mm. I mean, I'm still learning. I mean, I, what I've done is with this new business, I just have simplified it for me to understand you, it. Okay. So you had your own restaurant before or yeah. you ran a restaurant? And so I moved here to Nashville area about six, maybe, maybe six years ago, going uh-huh. on seven. And yeah, I did. I had. Where were we at before? Uh, so I lived in Tupelo, Mississippi. That's okay. where I'm originally from. Yeah, it's okay. Northeast Mississippi. Yeah. Good food down there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. So, uh, but I mean, I had. Um, I was so at the time I was co- I was a corporate chef, and I was. That's where Elvis is from, isn't it? Yeah, it's originally from Elvis. Okay. All right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, maybe one of the reasons why my son's name is Presley. Oh, yeah, so, okay. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. So. Um, I was a corporate chef at the time, literally flying out on Mondays, flying out on my Fridays. That was my life. Really? And I was a single father at the time. And so um, I kind of needed to be home. You know, yeah. I, I, I needed to be home for him. And so I decided, okay, well, what am I going to do if I come back to my little small town? Well, you know, I'm going to open up a restaurant. Because I knew all my restaurant tour friends in Tupelo. And a lot of times, you know, I, I like them as friends. But, come, but sometimes becoming business partners are not really great. So I just like, okay, well, I'm going to do my... I think it's time for me to open up my own restaurant. So I opened up Forklift, which was a, a fine dining restaurant. We were coming, uh, can't be, kind of had a whiskey bar there. We had a, over 200 oh, cool. different American whiskeys and bourbons and stuff. So we had a beautiful bar. And then I decided to open up next door. What I did was took a page out of one of my favorite chefs. And what he always does is he, he will sometimes put like two restaurants in one building. So it looks like two restaurants, but really what they're doing is they're working together with each other. So we did Butterbean, which was a biscuit and coffee shop, and I had a little easement that connected them, and then they would work with each other. So Butterbean would make all the pastries and desserts and everything for Forklift, and then Forklift would do anything. There are a lot of restaurants for. like that out there. Yeah, it's it's smart. It's yeah. really, really, really smart. So There's a place can, in Franklin that does that. Um, Gray, um, uh, Gray's and uh, OB, uh, uh, OB Joyful. They're, they actually have the same kitchen working with each right, other. So, right, right. Yeah. Go there might be the, other ones. There might be there other is, ones. I think there are some other ones. Because I've, I've seen them kind of go through the back alleyways yeah. and just or, whatever, oh. in, internally. Um, but I mean, so I, uh, I opened those two restaurants up. Um, I did it for about a year and a half, two years. Yeah. And I decided I want to move to Nashville. Um, what was that decision for? Um, family. Family. So, okay. yeah. I, um, I, I got here, I married and I had another child. So okay. That, so, um, but then COVID happened and you know, which just kind of wrecked everybody's world. Not so just, were you running your restaurants back in Tupelo? No, I'd sold them. I've moved here. I came back. Uh, you do, you remember before I said I was corporate chef, right? I went back to that company. Okay. But I just told him I would not travel like I did with them sure. uh, previously. And so I was working for those guys which it's kind of funny is nashville is like a mecca for for corporate like food service like there's so many corporate food service here so what i was doing for them was working together with a lot of these corporate headquarters here in nashville area and then doing a little bit of traveling for them and then like i said COVID happened um they held us on for about three months into COVID, and then they let us go which i was mad I was not mad at all you know because i actually kind of found myself fortunate I was like, man, I just lost my job, you know. I was like, but I could have owned a restaurant and could have lost everything, 
because I had so many chef friends that just lost everything during COVID. Totally. Because it, because I mean, you you could you could have been a restaurant, you could have been successful during COVID, but it was what kind of what kind of jo- not genre, but I mean, what kind of food you were serving in time? Like foods, like fine dining restaurants suffered because nobody wanted to pay thirty, forty dollars for an entree that was going to go into a to go box and then be Ubered to your house or this and that, you know. But like a restaurant that was something that you know was quick and easy and everything like that, you know, people were about that and stuff. So it, it kind of all differed on what type of restaurant you had during COVID. But I knew that because I had fine dining, I would have probably lost everything. I had the restaurant experience especially around here, changed astronomically. It did. After COVID. Service went down. If you could even find people to do service. They were literally just like, you know, you were just putting a, a warm body in a in a, in a a serving apron and saying, all right, go out there and just take a, the food to the table. Right, Tommy, I think that's a soapbox we don't want to get on. Because <laughs> no. there's many th- reasons why I could tell you. Well, I don't, that plays you know. into what you're doing, though, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, because, you, you know, you, you made these decisions – Post COVID, you know, it's like I don't want to manage a staff, and definitely don't want to manage a staff like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that led into where you're at now. Yeah, yeah. I, what what I did was uh, when I got laid off, I kind of said, "Oh, what, what do I want to do?" You know, I'm like mid forties. I've done this, this, and this in my career. What what do I love, and what do I hate? And the thing that kept coming up was, I want to be a restaurant chef, but I don't want to be a restaurant chef. Like, you don't want to be a restaurant chef, but I don't want to be a restaurant chef. Why don't I? Well, I don't want the stress. I don't want the hours. And I don't want the overhead anymore. You know? I mean, they, there's a statistic out there that says a good restaurant will make 10 to 11 cents on a dollar after they pay all their overhead out. You know? It's like, it's like I don't want to do that anymore. I want to work smart. You know? Right. I, want, I mean, I'll, I'll still work hard. I'll always work hard, but I want to re- work smart. So it was kind of like, okay, well, how can I be a restaurant chef and not be a restaurant chef? So, so you're saying like a thirty dollar plate of food, you only make three bucks? Mm-hmm. Crazy. Yeah, once you pay out over all your overhead. Yeah. Because people don't put in the, they go, oh, labor and that and food. <laughs> There's so many other things oh, I can no, go into. Like utility bills are probably crazy. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I mean, especially if you're using gas. Well, gas, and then not only that, your your you know your refrigeration's running twenty four seven. Totally. You know, so insurance insurance will eat you alive. Liquor's not cheap either. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then especially when liquor likes to be poured a little more, so then the ounce they should be getting. So oh man, so it's 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 it's, it's you're a one of those guys. <laughs> it's a beast. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So so you didn't want to be you wanted to be a chef, but you didn't want to be a chef. So it led to so part of, so part of my career, I was a I don't guess you would call me a professional fruit and vegetable carver. Okay, so so I hope I, that's on your resume. <laughs> it should be. If not. It's better be on your LinkedIn. Or, or the water, watermelon carver. I've been called numerous times. So so um, if we can go back and talk about this later. But I mean, it's like it's like I I I literally would travel the country doing fruit and vegetable carving, and um, and what I would do is this would be seasonal with like large like large brokers like Cisco, US Foods, things like that. And so what I had is off time. So like usually in the winter and usually in the fall, I would say it was spring and fall is when the shows were. And so usually I say it's winter and summer, I was doing a little bit of catering. So that, and now what I was doing is going into residence and doing dinners, you know, doing, right. uh, you know, private dinners. And the, pro- and the problem I saw was no matter what type of kitchen it was, no matter if it was something like this beautiful kitchen, I was taking things in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. So what I wanted to do was create something I because I thought about, oh, well, maybe that's the way I could have a restaurant but not have a restaurant. So so let me create a trailer that I could cook in so I'm not actually going into these people's houses and cooking. But then it was idea was taking things still in and out, in and out, because I'm cooking in this trailer, but we're taking it in and they're eating it in their house. Mm-hmm. So then one of the things I saw was I didn't want to create a I can't, I didn't want to create a footprint. Like if we came and did something at these people's take house, out. we want people to, at the end of the night, go, did I actually entertain tonight? Right. So then it was, idea was, okay, well, let's create a trailer that's literally a mobile restaurant that literally people walking from their, you know, their house out to say, say, uh, I would say, I would say probably nine out of 10 times we're going to residence. We're pulling literally in their driveway or right at the curb. They're coming out and they're eating. And so we want them to come out, have this amazing experience, and then go back in their house and go, 
did we entertain tonight? Like there's no footprint there whatsoever. So the idea was them coming aboard and, and eating on this mobile restaurant. Well, the problem is, is no one's never done this before. And so that's kind of, that's kind of crazy to think. It about. is crazy to think about that. Cause I think about it all the time. I think about it all the time. And, and you know, we, we found other things we found where people had, had like airstreams and it was cigar bars and all these different things, airstreams into bars and stuff of like that, but never. And it was hard for a lot of people to understand when we were first putting it all together was, you know, it's like people were like, are you parking this thing on the side? No, I'm not parking on the side of the road. You know, it's like, it's like we know each time because we're usually for hire. We know each time when we go out exactly where we're going, what we're serving, how many people we're serving, what we're serving them, this and that and everything. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's hard sometimes people to get the concept. I think even with you first, the first time we talked, it was like, what, what do you mean? And I go, no, it's not like a food trailer. Let me show you. And I show them a picture and people go, oh, this is not no, what I thought. it's not like a food truck. No. Because, you know, when you talk about mobile food, first thing you're going to think about is a food truck. A food truck. Mm -hmm. The taco truck's going to roll up. And, you know, I've, I've been to parties where, like, hey, the taco truck's out in the driveway. And you go out and, you know, get a taco or whatever. And, like, then you go back in the house and continue the party. This is not that concept. No, it's not. So we... So initially, it took a lot, it, it took a hard time finding somebody to fabricate it for us because we, we were going to fabricate an older trailer, yeah. but then we figured out that it really doesn't have the bones to to support. Because here's the problem: is that because no one has really ever done this before, there's there was nobody for me to ever go to and go, "Hey, what did you do the first three months, six months, sure. year, five years, ten years of having a mobile restaurant?" Like I could call guys who have food trucks and go. What did you do? But this is not a food truck again, like we were saying. So, so it was like, okay, well, this old trailer is not going to have the bone support this weight here, this weight here, because that was another thing. Is too, we have fourteen people coming aboard. We have to have it be able to support them from this time to this time. So all these things we were figuring out, and it's like an old trailer wouldn't do it. So we finally found a fabricator that wanted to take this project on because. So you built the trailer from scratch. We built this trailer from scratch. All right, so from scratch. Matt, pull this up, and you can kind of see this here on the monitor. Um, this is the trailer. Mm -hmm. That's you. That's you right there. That's me. That's me. Do you always wear the hat? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. No, I'm just no, no, with you. Normally cooking, yeah. So this is a forty-foot trailer. Yes, it is. Yeah. Talk us through it, man. Because you're you the level of detail that yeah. you've talked about with this is. Mm -hmm. So it, it's so. We, like you've thought about everything. Yeah. It seems like. So initially, when we when we'd call people, they'd be like, "Oh, we've never done anything like this," and they never wanted to take it on. And then also they didn't understand the madness that was going on in my head. Like they didn't understand what the wheels that were turning on what I wanted. And so we found these these guys that were doing um, they were doing food trucks, but they were thinking outside of the box of food trucks. So they were taking brand new chassis, putting an old fifty two body. Ford, like let's say old yeah. pickup truck body like on the front, riches. so it looked like this old vintage truck rolling down the road. But in return, it was a brand new food truck. So they were really kind of thinking outside the box. They were like, "Yeah, we've never done anything like this, but you know, we'll take it on." And so, so there was a lot to this trailer, like. Uh, the wheel well had to be back so far because the wheel well had to be in the kitchen. It couldn't be out in the dining room. So, I mean, I traveled. These guys were based out of Charleston, South Carolina. I mean, in a year's time, not even a year's time. It took us about, we started in January and we picked the trailer up in May of 2021. And um, they, I went over to Charleston, South Carolina six times. So it was almost like building a house. Like mm -hmm. I come on and we would make a lot of decisions when I would get there. Like those guys would, I would get them a list together when I get there and be like, okay, these are the decisions I have to make. And then between the two visits, they would work on that. And then, and then I would come back over and then we'd kind of make more decisions because they, same time they were learning too. They have were ever seen Monster Garage? Yeah. Yeah. That's like exactly what this sounds like. It's uh -huh. like you going over there and say, well, we got to make sure this does this because if it does, and then they as trailer builders have to understand the physics of that. Exactly. And then they have to kind of interpret what it means to run a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy next door literally dug up the concrete to run new piping. You know, it's like, I have no idea why he did that. I'm sure you do. Well, he has to, yeah. Yeah, and he had to by code. And the place looks great, by the mm -hmm. way. Um, um, but anyway, this is, so, yeah. So, I mean, I had designed and done <sighs> a lot of commercial it. kitchens. But, I mean, you know, I, this was still different. This was totally different. And... um. 
and then that's the reason why we're getting ready to build. Why'd you go with the Airstream look? I wanted vintage. I wanted a vintage look, but I'll be honest with you, um, probably won't do that again. Again, mm-hmm. the reason why is like I'm thinking logistics now. No one ever really walks up to the trailer and goes, "Ooh, vintage trailer." It's when they open up the door and they go, "Oh my god," because they they already have this mentality that they're walking and they're 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 going to have dinner in a trailer. So it it's not a good mentality. <laughs> There's no expectations. <laughs> I mean, I literally had the guy one night, he raised his hand and I said, yes, sir. And he goes, well, I just didn't have any expectations for you. And I go, what do you mean, sir? He goes, yeah, my wife said that uh, this trailer was going to pull up to our house and we were going to come out and have a fine dining experience. He goes, I mean, really? Seriously? And then he says, I'm a believer now. And now I've done probably over three dinners with those with those clients because they don't have an expectation. It's that thought of I'm coming into a trailer you know, because I don't know what people think of a, of, a, of a camper or this and that and everything. I guess a lot of them have never been in a hundred plus thousand dollar Airstream, which are pretty damn nice. But that's like a house, bro. Yeah. But I mean, it's like, so it's that expectation. So my next one, I'm probably not going to go vintage, vintage with it because the problem is, is that you're going to have problems with it. I mean, it's traveling down the road, road, you know, you, you're, you're, you're going to have logistical problems with it. It's kind of, I guess, having like a 52 Ford. If you had a 52 Ford and then you had to put it in the shop, it's much harder to fix that 52 Ford than if something was just like a 2023 blah, blah, blah. You know, so um, we are thinking more of the idea of logistics on our second one is like, how can we, if something happens to it, we can get it in the shop and get it out of the shop. Because that's the reason why we went with a trailer. Everybody goes, why didn't you put, why didn't you do a food truck with this? And I go, because I was told with somebody in the industry that had been more in the transportation industry as far as like uh, building trailers and then also not only building trailers she also had um, uh, like a celebrity coach kind of like company and so that with with touring buses she said take the motorway she goes motors are always going to have problems and he goes and she goes also another thing is too she goes if you have a food truck and it goes down when you put it in the shop you're out of work she goes if your truck goes down and you're pulling a food trailer, you go, you either call some, your, one of your friends, bar their truck, or you go rent a truck and you're still able to work, able to work. So that was one of the things was, I'm trying to think of the whole idea is like, if something happens to it, how can I get it in the shop, out of the shop really quickly and so on. So it, it, the second one, it's all about logistics. Like now I know because it's trial and error. So is the first one all about creativity? But the second one's gonna be like creativity too. Well, that's not going away. But not creativity is on. I think I think exterior creativity is not gonna be there. It's gonna be the interior uh, creativity. Like the second one's second one's designed by a is designed by a is designed. I'm sorry, is designed around a stove. Like I already have a stove that is, is a pizza? work of art. Is it pizza stuff? No, 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 no. It's just it's just a beautiful Italian stove from. Um, I mean, just like a regular stove, you know, oh, with so, your burners yeah, and yeah, that. Yeah. But it's matte black and brass, oh, man. and so it's it's all of it's being designed around that that stuff. Where does your inspiration for your interior design come from? I don't know. It just comes. It just. Nah, out I mean, of the I've, ether. Al- I've always kind of been artistic my whole sure, life. Sure, no kidding. Draw, drawing, drawing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I can yeah. honestly see like your bourbon bar mentality a little bit in this mm-hmm. one. Um, so it, with the wood interior and yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll have to say that I think I missed Fort Cliff. So there's a little bit of forklift in that. Like I designed forklift and worked with architects and designers with forklift and everything. And so my my previous restaurant I sold. So there's a little bit of that. That white subway tile, that wood and everything is a little bit of forklift. So I think it was still me reminiscing about forklift. Now my second trailer is gonna look nothing like this first one. Nothing at all. Probably shouldn't. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And, I, and and probably what I end up doing is every every so often, every year or two, uh, building a new trailer, unloading it to a chef because right now I have a chef that wants to buy this trailer but the problem is is I can't sell that trailer yeah, until I have my else. second trailer <laughs> so is that the goal to is, the, is to set these up for people I think so that's what we've seen so so in, uh, we've been in business for 24 months and one year I saw or 12 months I saw a profit which is kind of unheard of in this industry no kidding. and then I've also paid that trailer off so that's kind of you know so pro- profits are good because because again I wanted no stress, no hours, or no, no stress. 
you know, I was, I did, I wanted to get out of industry because I think, I think there's some stuff to clarify okay. here. Cause like, you know, you talked about coming out of culinary school and I want to be yeah. an executive chef. I, I think we need to be very clear in the fact that you probably can't come out of culinary school. Now you might, you yeah. might be, you might be that, that savvy, you know, you might be that creative that have that mentality, but you, it, it took you a long time to get to this point. Now, and I don't, I don't think this is, I, I actually honestly don't. Do you think, think you could have done this right out of school? No, no, not at all. No, 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 no. And the thing about it is, I don't think a culinary student can come out of culinary school doing this. Well, I think there's more to, and obviously they can only see so much from this website that we're showing. I really think like you can't appreciate the details of the things you've learned and how those were applied to to coming up with this concept. Because are you familiar with the term a blue ocean? Mm -hmm. Finding your blue ocean. Do you understand what that yeah, means? Yeah, I do. And you found that. You like you've literally made in a lot of ways, not just food trucks, but even restaurants a little bit. Like you're not even competing with them. You're just in your own mm, own space. I mean, same, same. You know, and every week it's it's what's funny about it is every week it, it totally changes. You know, like one week we were in a liquor store liquor store parking lot doing a um a bourbon tasting for a group of eight guys. And then the next night we were um at a residence, pulled right up in their driveway. And 14 people came out and had a fun dining experience. And then the next night we were out at out a farm, doing a farm to table dinner. But our joke is we're not farm to table anymore. Now we're table to the farm. Because I mean, we literally were right, parked out in the middle of one of their fields doing a dinner with a lot of their agriculture. Because that's another big thing of mine too, is that um, as a chef now, I'm cooking. Uh, or I've gone back to cooking. Like when I owned the restaurant, all I did was put up fires. That's yeah. all I did. And I, I wasn't doing what I right. loved anymore. Right. And I was cooking. Now I'm back to cooking because people always go ask me, they say, what's your staff? It's me and one other person. And it's usually wait staff that comes in. Like I'm cooking. I want to cook. But the thing is, is that my time is actually spent not actually cooking. You know, it's, it's actually sourcing. Like, so the, the agriculture in the middle of Tennessee is mind boggling. I mean, right now, I mean, where we sit right here, five minutes away is, is this beautiful farm that I can source probably some of the best beef that I've ever worked with in my whole career. And it's like, that's what I'm doing is like now spending the time traveling around to all these farms and building these beautiful relationships with these farms. So I'm making sure that the quality of the product that I'm serving to my guests is top notch. I think there's so much to unpack here with you, David. I don't think even sometimes your mind is constantly, you know, doing this it and it's like, you know, but I don't think you realize like, maybe you do, maybe you sit, I don't know if you consciously think about this, but the, the creative problem solving you do with the critical thinking skills that you have are probably instilled in you from early on working in a restaurant with your dad. And I, you said before we even started the show, it's like everybody should work in a restaurant because there are so many factors that come into a restaurant you know, that you have to work under pressure. You have to think creatively. Mm -hmm. What happens if you run out of this? What are you going to, how are you going to solve this problem? Um, you know, and, you know, I've worked in a restaurant. I, I was a server a couple of times, you know, um, and it's tough. It's a lot to remember, man. You know, when you got ADD, I had to, I had to write everything down. I couldn't just, <laughs> I couldn't remember. That wasn't one of those people that goes, yeah, you said this, you said, I don't, it wasn't me. Yeah. Uh, but I always had a good attitude, you know, about it. And I think that was where I started with it. But, my point is here is like when you're looking at this from hey just any business any business not just the food services business you're taking like you've taken something that you know and you've sat down it's come, literally like you, you you got shoved to the side because of a pandemic and said hey well you can't work right now mm -hmm. but that didn't stop you right you sat down and said all right how can i not only do this better how am I going to do this different? You know, how am I going to make it successful? Because, you know, if you were trying to pitch this to somebody, they'd probably go, look, man, why are you making a food truck? And not everybody gets it, mm -hmm. right? Nobody gets the concepts. Um, I think what impresses me so much is like, it's not so much that you made a food trailer. It's like all the things that go around it. And it's like, you're not even done. Mm -hmm. Now you're thinking of a whole nother level. How do I make this a different kind of business, another kind of business? And then how do I bring this to the table? Like the mind doesn't stop working with you, man. <laughs> and and, it, and it, we we've what what we've seen is that or what I what I what I've seen is that um, there's two different businesses. I could take this business and what I could do is uh, create like some type of central location like commissary and then have numerous trailers 
like I could have you know, fleet. 10, yeah, yeah fl- fleet. It'd be a Commodore yeah. at that point. And so, and, and we also see it in this industry, I mean, in this, in this town, I mean, we could do that just generating through, through, you know, going to residents and doing mm-hmm. dinners, you know, I mean, but we also see with the industry too, is that we could possibly do it going out onto music industry, you know, like right now artists are wanting us to come out because I mean, we're literally all a car restaurant that could follow them on tour and stuff. So, so we see multiple things, but then it goes, it goes back to that whole idea is like, is this what I want? Is it, you know, am I now going to go back to putting out fires, you mm-hmm. know, worrying about this trailer here, this trailer, this trailer, this trailer, this trailer, this trailer's here. So see, so the other, other business that we've seen is that I've seen in two years what this has given to me. Number one, it's giving me, it's giving me an, an income. And another thing it's given me is I have a 15 year old, a five year old. Um, I had a surreal moment with my 15 year old this year. I was sitting at a football game on the Friday night. And I just kind of like went, I'm going to say it. Holy shit. I'm, I'm, I'm at a football game. You know, it's like, I would never had this. Never, never had this. So, so, so it's like, it's like as a, as a chef or owning a restaurant, I, I never, I never on a Friday night would have been like that, you know? And so now it's kind of like, it's given me the freedom to be able to, to be able to do more and that, you know? And it's like, um, I do two to three dinners a week and that's it. That's all I do. And, and, and that gives me to be able to have a family life, you know? So you bought back time. I, I'm, I'm trying, <laughs> trying. It's a hard thing to do, man, because so many people trade time for money, you know, and it's, uh, it's a hard, I don't know, you know, we all kind of got to college and we got to get a job and, you know, it's like, we don't realize just how much we can't buy back that time. Mm -mm. You can't get it back. And like you've used not only your creative prowess, but your business sensibility in order to make that happen, you know, and I think that's a huge differentiator, you know, because I think so many of us realize, oh, I think, oh, I just got to go find a job and I'll work real hard and I'll get ahead. But I think I found it's like, and I've done a lot of different jobs, you know, it's like being able to create for yourself is one thing. Being able to create for yourself and actually get paid what you want to get paid to earn, to make money at it, whole different concept, you know, because everybody has ideas. I think there's so many people that have ideas. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this. I want to do a podcast. I want to do something, you know, but at the end of the day, it's like, how do you make money at that? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and why are you doing that? Are you just spinning your wheels? I don't think, I'm sure there's probably times you've sat around and go, man, I'm just spinning my wheels here. Maybe it was when you're running your restaurant. Maybe it was you're doing, you know, corporate work, but you seem to have, I don't know how much, how much, I guess, breaking out, did it take like you know the whole i how much struggle how much stress how much tear how many tears did it take you to get to this you know because what you got is a cool idea a really cool concept you're you've got time now you're making some money you know you're not really risk constrained by the limits of a physical location or Mm -hmm. uh, you know overhead with people Mm -hmm. um not to say you don't have responsibilities not to say you don't have you know any stress you know mm-hmm. at the same time it's like you kind of work through all that where did all the, how did you get there trial and error yeah. and, and, and that's what that's what this is this is also trial and error again i have nobody to call to get any knowledge base from you know as far as the logistics of you know because everybody's always asked me what's the hardest thing with this I think the hardest struggle that I've had with this mobile restaurant is that I went from driving a Honda Cross Tour, so a hatchback Honda Accord, to now I drive a Ram 3500 standard cab. So now I drive a truck that's a beast, then that hooks up to a 40 foot long trailer. So the hardest thing has been is like adapting to the idea of I'm going into this really nice neighborhood. How am I going to get this into their driveway? And then the second thing is, how do I get it back out of their driveway? That's been the hardest thing. But then that's that's the thing about it is, I think that's where we see with the biz- this business is, what we could do is create the trailer, sell the trailer to a chef. And here's the greatest thing about it is, for what I have invested into this business is a mere fraction of what a chef would have invested into a brick and mortar. So there's going to be chefs that are never going to have the financial ability to be able to have, ever have a brick and mortar. But why should that hold them back? And some could say, oh, that's not a restaurant, Pfft, whatever. 
this is a 14 seat restaurant. It's just mobile. And the coolest thing about it is tonight it could be here, tonight it could be here, and tonight it could be here. So every place it could be totally somewhere different. So your atmosphere is always, always changing. So, so what we see is that we could, we could build this for chefs. And then what we would do is because trial and error and I'm learning, listen, I've have, I've failed. I'm not going to go into what I've felt about, but I mean, it's a lot, but I've learned from it. And so what we want to do is consult with chefs to give them the knowledge base of how they could have this. How important is failure to you? Oh, it's, it's ma- ma- majorly important. Some of the biggest chefs in the industry, I mean, Lane Ducasse says he budgets so much money a year to be able to fail. I mean, and like here again, here's a guy that's like elite in our industry, but he still budgets every year to fail because the reason why is he wants to fail. He wants to fail to learn from it. Because if you don't fail, you're not going to learn. You're not going to learn. I, always, I told my 15-year-old the other day, I said, everything comes in our life for one reason, one reason only. It's to learn from it. it we, if it's good, we learn from it. We do it again. If it's bad, we learn from it to not do it again. But every, every experience in our life is to learn from. And every day I go out with this thing, it's in the learning experience. So that's what we would love to do is give other chefs this life to be able to have a business like this. And here's the thing about it is I'm not wanting to tell them how to run their business. What I want to do is logistically give them what they need to do to be able to do their business. I choose to only do two to three days a week. And every time I choose to be in a different location, if a chef decided, Hey, I'm going to park on this side of town for six months and stay there and shoreline it as they say in the industry they could keep it there they could keep it there and then all of a sudden after six months take it to the other side of town i guess what you can't do with a brick and mortar you can't do that no you know i i think you're on to something more than just the mobile restaurant well and i and when i when i say that i say that in the sense of the way you think is a business in itself mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, we're looking at one of the things we're looking at right now is as it being a floor plan. So the next trailer, we're looking at it as a floor plan. So let's look at our mine as a floor plan of a restaurant. You have the kitchen, you have the dining room. Okay, well, let's say you're a bartender. Bar, lounge. Say you're a coffee shop. Coffee shop, lounge. So what we're wanting to do is start looking at this, not just a mobile restaurant business, but a mobile business how could we possibly convert these trailers so now we have a fabricator because people see what we built they understand it so now we actually have fabricators that are lined up wanting to build these for us and so what we're going to do is produce a trailer and then we have somebody here locally that can do all the custom work for it so he or she i mean he or she could say oh i want this so here's the thing about it is maybe there's a baseline for the trailer and this is what it costs but maybe maybe you have a really nice budget and they want to do this 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 this, and this so this customizer will be able to customize it to their budget of what they want so you've created a I mean, uh, honestly, it could, it could be. I mean, we could turn. You created those, a secondary market all turn, by yourself. We could turn one of those into a. We could turn one of those into a comic book store. You know, we talked about that. So, we talked about that early on because, like, it just it would be easier to roll up to somebody. The biggest challenge with for us, and maybe this is something to think about. You know, because this is where I think your head is. All right, you don't just let the the one challenge or the second challenge stop you. Like, how do I figure out? I figure out a way around this. How do I, not only do I figure out a way around this, how do I make it work? And not only how to make it work, how do I make it super, super successful by, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, defeating these challenges. But you're, we did talk about that because we thought, man, we could just roll into these little towns that don't have comic shops and just, you know, um, it's a different market for sure. Um, but you don't have the overhead of having carrying a building around with you, you know, and we've talked about that many times, how that would be a cool idea. Uh, we talked about like having like a school bus or something where you just rolled mm-hmm. up and people, oh, those comic buses here. And uh, I don't know, people are not going to steal our ideas now, but <laughs> that's fine. Uh, well, what, here's, you here. know, it's, it's, it is, it's an interesting thing. I think what you're doing is so cool in the sense, it's like I said, it's not so much that you made a food restaurant, I mean, a mobile restaurant. It's the well mindset that you have. I will tell you this, as I tell it all the time, it's like, I'm a talented chef. I can. I can cook really well, but that's not what I'm selling you. No, hundred percent not. I'm I'm selling you an experience. Is what I'm doing. Like every dinner, 
like I'm coming out. Like usually our dinner is about six courses, you know, minimally six courses. Like I've had some dinners go up to eight, ten courses, but six courses. And what we do is I come out every course and I talk and I tell them exactly what they're eating, where I've sourced it from and why. You know, it's like every time anybody ever contacts me about doing a dinner, then the first thing they always ask is about menu. And I just tell them, I don't have a side menu. Like I'm inspired by what's available and in season at the time. You know, pretty well I can say, oh, this is what proteins I can source from. You know, over here at Bear Creek Farms, over at Thompson Station, I can go, hey, I can get these primals year round with these guys. So that I can kind of go, this is what I have. But right now it's like, you know, Devon Farms is just harvested beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Brussels sprouts. You can get Brussels sprouts year round, but these are in season and the flavor on these Brussels sprouts are totally different than a Brussels sprout. I would get out of season, you know? So, so that is my whole thing is like, it's like being inspired by what's surrounding me at all times and, and learning from it. So about totally learning from it. So, well, like I said, man, it's like, it's, it's a, I think what you've come across is much more than just a concept, but I, literally like there's a mentality you possess that I don't run across very often with yeah. just about anybody that's an entrepreneur that wants to start a business. I mean, I don't even possess it and like to think I'm a little creative and I think there's something to learn there, you know, because you know, I've got an educational background and this is not something you teach mm-hmm. and not to say it can't be taught, but the, the, the skills you apply in critical thinking and creative problem solving, it's like you don't do not let the world around you or the industries that exist or the markets that exist prohibit you from thinking outside of the box. Like you're literally cr- draw, you know, coloring outside the lines here. And I don't think you operate any other way. I don't think you're capable of it. You're not, you're not going to follow this path, but at the same time you have foundational structures, right? Mm-hmm. You know, from your hard work ethic learned as a kid, your school experience, you know, your experience in this place and this place and this place and this place and this place that's gotten you here. So you have these fundamentals, but you also possess this mindset that's like, there's a better way of doing it. There's a different way of doing it. I, I'll give you an example. I, I had a friend, she um, she worked in some, she got interviewed for some corporate job in New York City. And she was young at the time. And they part of the interview question, they said, she was in a conference room and she says, um, what would you do to rearrange this room? And her response was, move the door. <laughs> and I think that's how you think. It's like, mm-hmm. I'm just going to move the door. It's like you're like in the matrix. You're just going to rearrange reality yeah. in order to make something work for, you know. The, it's like, it's like I want to be a restaurant chef, but I don't want to be a restaurant chef. So how can I create the idea of being a restaurant chef, but not deal with the things I want to deal with, hour stress and overhead? It's like, how can I create something to be able to not deal with those? Because and, I, and you see what I'm saying, right? Yeah, no, I do. You can literally sit down and teach people, look, you got to think a little differently. Now, now, here's one thing I do have that I tell people that it's not a bad thing. It's OCD, you know? Uh, so I'm very, 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 very organized. And that's what's helped me with this, this path is like, you know, creating guidelines and things that I have to follow. Now, I think outside of the box is other things, but then there are certain things that I'm like about. It's like this, 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 and this. I mean, one of the biggest reasons why it's an open kitchen, I mean, I probably could have put a wall where you couldn't see in there, but that would have shut off the experience that you're having because you're seeing me in there cooking at all time. Plus another thing is, again, I'm OCD. I want you to see how clean, Details, man. How clean that kitchen is <laughs> at all times. Um, somebody asked me the other day, why don't, why don't I trademark this idea? And the problem is, is that I don't think it's trademarkable. You know, I could probably talk to some attorneys and they might be say, yeah, it is, blah, blah, blah. The problem is, is like, you know, with trademarks is that, or if something's patented, it's like, if you can, if you change one minor thing, then there's no infringement anymore. So to me, it's like, they, I could create a floor plan for a trailer and that's my standard floor plan that I've trademarked or patented and so that, and then it'd be like, okay, that's it. One well, person could change one thing of the trailer and then start doing this business. 
only thing that I say that I have that they don't have is that now I've been doing this for 24 months. So they're now not having the knowledge base that I have to understand what the do's and don'ts are. Well, you know, I, um, I told you I worked in a couple of restaurants. Yeah. One of those, I was actually a server. And then the other one, I unbelievably, unbelievably, they were both pizza restaurants at, at their core. <laughs> one actually just served like pizza and beer. And the other one, this is the one I worked at in Los Love Angeles. It. Simple. Yeah. Um, they, they didn't have a liquor license, but they sold $40 pizzas. This was in L. This is almost, this is West Hollywood. So mm-hmm. it was pretty high end. But the majority of this guy's business was done between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. when the club shut down. So already he's in a space where he's like, I'm going to be open when nobody else is. That's number one. Um, but I remember asking the owner one time, I said, what? And he wasn't a chef, I don't think. I don't remember him being a chef. I just was a business guy. But I remember asking him, I said, straight up, I said, what makes your restaurant better than this guy's? That was kind of how I asked him. So when you're talking about, can somebody copy this? course they're going to copy it but it's like man what what makes you so what makes your restaurant better than this guy's restaurant and he was like tommy nobody can do this like i can i thought man that is a bold statement Mm -hmm. and that was the confidence he carried into everything he did he's like nobody's going to do this like me this is the environment i'm going to create this is the the experience i'm going to create this is what people i'm going to expect of my staff and that's I think that's important to to what you're doing. It's like you you already know. It's like even if I was to go over here, and say, all right, David, I'm uh I'm gonna have me a hundred thousand dollar food trailer driving around Nashville. I'm not you, man. Mm-hmm. I'm never gonna be able to re- re- even if I was as good a chef as you. You know, I can't recreate the experience that you have. That's right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah. When all all said and done, even yeah, that goes back to when I was a fruit and vegetable carver. So, um, you know, I told you that he's been on your LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, literally I have, you can go on my website. Uh, it's foods, foodsmithnational.com. There's a tab you click on. It says carving. Most people think, I guess there's carving, but then that's, you click on carving because people still know yeah, me. From, for, hey, there we, yeah, yeah, there you go. Cool. Yeah. So, so, um, I, I halfway through culinary school, I had a chef that told me to find a niche. He said, well, round yourself as a chef, but find something that makes you different than every other chef. And so I lo- I've always loved art and food. And so I just kind of put my love for art and food together. And I started self-teaching myself. And then about two years into it, uh, chefs were acknowledging what I was doing because what I was doing is kind of creating a new style. This is a very Asian dominated art. So you usually would learn through. Uh, yeah, that looks like a dragon. Yeah, it is. It's, so you would learn through a book that's either, uh, you know, from China or something like that. Or you would learn from a, an Asian chef that, that you might Elvis? be working through a kitchen. Yep. <laughs> now, I've literally have a card from SpongeBob SquarePants, Elvis Presley to Jesus Christ to a, I've done a drum set on a watermelon. I actually did a special one time for TLC where we did a life-size woman and I used mostly watermelons. So I, I usually go toward <laughs> watermelons. I love the median, uh, the, the, That's a lot to work with. Yes. Yeah. And, and good structure too. It's the, um, and so, or stability, I guess you would say. Um, but I, chefs were acknowledging and they wanted to learn how. And so what I did was I, I looked at the market and said, okay, well, what's out there? It's all books. The problem with books is, and how I learned was it's a long, slow process. They show you in probably two, you know, say they showed you in two or three steps where they probably should have showed you in 12 steps. So the basic beginner is not going to be able to open that book and learn how. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to go audio visual. And the reason why is because I, I hear all the time. It's like, if you could show me step to step on how to do it. And I was seeing that through doing some uh, continuing education classes at community colleges, teaching people how that never picked up a knock before. And then by the end of the class, be like impressed with what they'd carved because they'd seen step to step step. So we did uh, instructional DVDs. So I re- released my first instructional DVD in 2002. And that's um, how I got connected with the knife company that I was corporate chef with for many years. Um, I needed tools. And so I approached this knife company based out of Massachusetts, the oldest knife manufacturer in the country. And so they did a private label knives for me that went together with the DVDs. So I would go to these Cisco shows or U.S. food shows you know, all over the country and be this appearance. And I'd be like Edward Scissorhands over in the in produce area, just carving <laughs> watermelons as fast as I could carve. Like still to date, like if you can, if he, if he scrolls down a little bit, there's a YouTube video of me carving actually 
go down a little bit more. I think it's it's one of the I think it's the middle one right there. If you click on it, it actually is me carving a watermelon, and my record is two minutes and seven seconds, literally from a watermelon to a flower. Nine inner petals, thirteen outer petals, a leaf on a border, in two minutes and seven seconds. And see, and so I'd go into these shows and I'd be doing this. But then what I created was I created merch. I created DVDs. I had knives. I had T-shirts. I had all this. I was doing this in the mid, you know, like, like it's 2002, 2003. Long before they were influencers. Yeah. So, so, so the people go, you know, always asking me about being a fruit and vegetable carver. I'm like, guess what? I'm not the best fruit and vegetable carver out there. What I am is I know how to market myself. I know how to market myself. And then also knew my audiences too, because I was going in, I mean, I was going into schools, I was going into community college, I mean, I was going all over the place, but I knew my market. I always like, if I went into a culinary school, I'd wear my chef's coat. If I went into grammar school, I'd have like a shirt on that said, I can cook. You know, so I knew my market and I became relatable to every market that I went into, every market, you know? And so um, that's kind of what I tell people now. It's like, I'm not the best chef out there. I'm not the best restaurant tour out there. What I am is I know how to market myself and I'm a selling experience to you guys. That's really what I'm doing. It's like if if we came to your house tonight and did a dinner, at the end of it you'd be like, "Wow. You know, I've 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 sold an experience to you. An experience to you." So, and and at the end of it, I always tell people, I go, "You know, if you took anything from me tonight, I hope you took from me my love for food." That's the biggest thing. And not only just my love for food, my love for local food. Again, we were talking about earlier the local agriculture here in Middle Tennessee is mind boggling. So I love, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, it's like what I spent with one of the farms here locally. And there's a substantial amount of money that I spent with them. But the greatest thing it made me feel about that is that I spent that money and it was with a family owned farm that's literally five minutes away from my house. That's what made me feel great. You know, not, not, I mean, their product's amazing, but it's that 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 feeling of that I'm not supporting them, but I mean, I guess supporting them. But but well, David, man, you're a true entrepreneur. <laughs> like I said, you created not only your own, your own mark your own market, but you've basically built some Still, secondary. You're you're supporting. Yeah. Um, Still learning, man. That's yeah. that's a promise. That's the biggest thing is like today I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna learn from it. And, so that, and that's why I always tell people it's like it's like check ego at the door. You know, at the end of the day, you can't do it by yourself. You got to have help. And then the other thing is check ego at the door because you're not gonna you're not gonna ever know everything. So I love it. I love it, man. Hey, listen. So where we where do we find foodsmithnashville dot com? Yeah, foodsmithnashville dot com is my website, and then I'm pretty well on all the it's all the social channels. Yeah, I'm on. Um, Instagram and also Facebook. Well, I have to so, say, man, if you're, there's a, like I said, you bring a lot more to the table than just food and thank I, you. and that you do well. So just imagine all these other things that you're bringing to the table as well. And thank I, so I could probably pick your brain for hours, even just how to do my businesses better. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think you see, I think you see the world, not definitely not for what it is, but definitely for what it could be. And yeah. that's, that's a huge, huge skill. Well, I think, I think the biggest thing is too, Tommy, is not shutting yourself out to people. It's like, I mean, today through this podcast, I've learned something, you know? Oh, that's so, good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's the whole thing. It's like, I think people shut their self out because they're so ego driven. It's like, it's like, oh, I can't learn anything from them. Uh, yes, you can. Oh, I can learn anything from Everybody. I can learn a lot from you just from Everybody. this little conversation we've had today. I'm yeah. like, oh man, I just, I'm I'm I got these que- I got questions now, you know, which is awesome. And I think that's where we all need to be. Yeah, we all need to be. I mean, you said it. You said it 50 times in this podcast. You can always learn something today. Mm-hmm. What you know, and it's just being able to have the mindset of saying what what is it I'm going to learn now. It could be you learn from failure or mm-hmm. you learn from success, but you're going to learn something. Sometimes sometimes it could be just shutting up. Just I have a hard time. With that. <laughs> you know, and it's and just you know listening, listening. You know, yeah, but I think so many times we want to talk, 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 and we don't want to just listen. If you just sometimes just shut up and listen, you're gonna learn something. So I'm gonna write that one down. Shut up and listen. <laughs> but I got a t-shirt and sell that. <laughs> listen, back in the day, I had t-shirts that said everything. From uh, my motto was, "I play with my food." 
and and I had T-shirts from all the way to one uh, T, all the way up to a triple X that said "I play with my food." And then I had all these funny sayings that where chefs would buy, you know, like having a kitchen doesn't make you a chef. You know, uh, men love women, women women love chocolate. Deal with it. Uh, chefs do it better because of big utensils. I mean, it's just on and on. I mean, it was all about merch. You know, it's like yeah. I mean, I would go to these shows and I would make a nice appearance fee, but then I would turn around and sell twice my appearance fee in merch. You know, so. Well, man, like I said, you're you're. You're one of a kind, man. Thank you. I was really looking forward to this conversation today. And like I said, I could probably talk another two hours. We could, but, we could, but I've definitely got to open this comedy shop. We've already <laughs> had one customer roll up in here and look at books. Uh, I told you, I felt like a joke today. It's like, <laughs> what do you get when a chef does a podcast in a comic book store? You oh, know? yeah. So, I, that is a joke. Would I ever thought that I would be doing a podcast? I, I, a- we will probably transcend the comic book shop. And I'm, one of these days I'll explain, you know, we definitely use this because this is where our space is, but we are utilizing what we have at our means, you I know, because I don't want to be, I can't wait for the weather to be right to start, to start this, you know? So I'm doing it where I can, when I can, and with who I can. Um, I know it's going to evolve. I'm still trying to find the voice of this show. Um, but what I'm not going to do is just sit over here and like, well, if I got this camera, if I got this thing, you know, I do need help. I can't do this by myself, you know, because there are some, you know, bells and whistles to turn in the background. But yeah. uh, for the most part, it's like I just was like, I know I've got the one thing I carry is I've just got a, a lifetime of these experiences with people, different people in different places. And I think maybe they don't learn something from me, but, but they, they'll definitely learn something from you. Mm-hmm. And that's what I want to share with people through this through this show is what can someone take away from this by just meeting you, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's just where my head was at. So I'm doing what I know how to do, which is media, you know? That's right. And I didn't get here by accident. You know, I was, well, maybe a little bit, but <laughs> I definitely, you know, looking back on it, if I'd have had a little bit more of a guiding star with this, I probably would have taken some different turns, but I knew I wanted to do something creative and I was, more of a visual person than I was, you know, written word. Um, but, you know, I think I've kind of found, I, I remember, like I said, years ago, I worked at a college and I remember the media professor came up to me and said, this one student, man, he, he's going to do a, a podcast for his thesis. And I thought to myself, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. And now I'm sitting there going, yep, that was, <laughs> like you said, you just never know. You never know where it's going to take you. So, well, listen, man. Um, Thank you. Y'all check out David um, on on his website and on his socials. I promise you will not be let down. If you are listening and you're in the area, definitely give him, reach out to him because yes. you will not be disappointed. Now they can uh, contact me through my website. Yep. So yeah. yeah, fantastic. Well, Dave. Awesome. Hey, man. Hope you have a happy new year. I will. Thank and so thanks much. for coming out today. Thank you. All right.